Well, I'd like to uh, begin today with uh, a brief prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm reminded of your promise that says in Isaiah 55:11, so my word that goes out of my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. I pray that what is of you will accomplish your purposes today, and anything that is not of you will not take root in any mind or heart in Yeshua's name. Today, we're going to be talking about connecting the dots of Israel's recurring appointed time apostasies. And we're going to start by reading Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. <clears throat> congregation, as many of you know, is from Strong's Concordance number 4150, which means Moedim, or appointed times to meet with yud heh We will see from early on in Is Israel's history, Lucifer's efforts have been directed towards corrupting and usurping the appointed times when Yah's people are to meet with him. It has been said that those who fail to learn the lessons of history are bound to repeat them. So let's purpose to learn from Israel's mistakes and be on guard to avoid them at all costs. So we're going to be looking at a few different examples. We'll call it the first dot. And we'll start reading from Exodus 32.1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, let us make gods that shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. In some ways, it's quite sad to see how quickly Israel turned to idolatry after Elohim had just delivered them from Egyptian bondage and gave them his Torah, his verbal instructions, only 40 days earlier at Mount Sinai. Exodus 32, 2-4 says, and Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold earrings from their hand and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Exodus 32, 4b. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose up early on the next day, and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. The feast, which is... Uh, Strong's H, uh, 2282 Hog that Aaron proclaimed it should have been a celebration to glorify the giver of the codified law on the two tablets of stone. The Ten Commandments on the two uh, stone tablets constituted a ketubah, which means written in Hebrew. It was Israel's written betrothal contract, which was quickly broken by Moses due to their idolatry. In Exodus 32, 8, we read, 
and they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them, and they have made for themselves a molded calf, and worshipped it, and sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. The golden calf was the beginning of a pattern of related idolatrous apostasies throughout Israel's history. What, these golden, what did these golden calves represent? We're not specifically told in the Exodus account, but the promise prophet Amos gave us some clear hints in Amos chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, which we'll now read. Have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness these 40 years, O house of Israel? But you have borne the tabernacle of Moloch and hewn your uh, uh, images, which were the golden cows, the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. And verse 27 says, Therefore I will cause you to inquire into captivity, I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Next, let's read the same passage from the Amplified Bible. Amos 5, 25-27 again. Did you bring me sacrifices and grain offerings during those 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? Certainly not. You carried along your king, Molech, and Hewn, your man-made gods of Saturn, your images, the, your images of your star god, which you made for yourselves, but you brought me none of the appointed sacrifices. Therefore, I will send you into exile far beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Why did the eminently qualified translators of the Amplified Bible add, your made, man-made gods of Saturn, in verse 26? It turns out that there are some good reasons. The connections between Cayune and Saturn are numerous as the following quotes show. The Encyclopedia Judaica describes Kiyun in this way. Kiyun is identified with the study one, quote unquote, the title of the star god Saturn. From Wikipedia we read, the star of your god, from Amos 5.26, R. Isaac Carroll, says all the astrologers represented Saturn as the star of Israel. Probably there was a figure of a star on the head of the image of the idol to represent the planet, the planet Saturn, Q. This is the same with Shevan, which in Arabic and Persian languages is the name of Saturn as Abim, Ezra, and Kichi kimchi state. Brown driver Briggs lexicon gives this definition of Q, an image or a pillar, probably a statue of Assyrian Babylon god of the planet centered and used to symbolize, symbolize Israelite apostasy. From uh, Bible Truth Publishers, we read, the majority of those interpreters who suppose Kiyun to be a proper name take it to mean the planet Saturn. International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says Kiyun, the passage in Amos 5.26 refers to Saturn worship which appears to have been in vogue in the proper in the prophet's days. And from Bibleandscience.com we read, Saturn is also thought to be the planet of the Jews because of these verses, meaning Amos 5, uh, verses 25 through 26, and also Damascus document 7, verses 14 through 15. 
The Saturn idol connection is unmistakable. Some wanting to escape the Kiyun Saturn idol connection have tried to associate the golden calf with the image of the sun god. There are reasons why this association is a minority view and highly uh, likely to be inaccurate. The term star or star god uh, from uh, Amos was a commonly used term for the five planets that rotate around the sun of which Saturn was one. The five planets plus the sun and the moon eventually evolved into the foundation for what later became the planetary calendar. BibleStudy.org writes, during biblical times, the only planets viewable from the Earth were Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Some of these can be found in the scripture, but only by the false gods astronomy have associated with them. The term star was not referencing what we think of uh, today as uh, a star, nor could the sun be that star since the sun is not a planet and obviously does not rotate around itself. Furthermore, we know that the term star god was not a reference to the sun because, among other reasons, the well-documented origins of the Hebrew word kiyun is consistently associated with the Plattern planet Saturn. Returning now to Amos uh, chapter 5, Let's read uh, verses uh, 25 through 27 again. Did you bring me sacrifices and grain offerings during those 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? Certainly not. You carried along your king, Sikuth and Kiun, your man-made gods of Saturn, your images of your star god, which you made for yourselves, but you brought me none of the appointed sacrifices. Take note of verse 26, where it says you carried along during the 40 years. Uh, uh, Amos is telling us that Israel continued with her idolatrous worship and practices, at least in some form, during their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. The significance of this will be seen later. In the meantime, this begs the question, how could Israel, who owed their very deliverance from, from a bondage in Egypt, succumb so quickly to such idolatry? Perhaps part of the answer can be found in King, 2 Kings 17, uh, 33 which says, they, meaning Israel, feared the Lord, yet they served their own gods according to the rituals of the nations from among whom they were carried away. It is not without purpose that the Holy Spirit inspired uh, the Apostle Paul to write the following from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11a. All the tests that they endured, in, a, in parenthesis, I said, and failed, so the emphasis is mine, uh, all the tests that they have endured on their way through the wilderness are a symbolic picture, an example that provides us with a warning so that we can learn through what they experienced. The lesson for us here is let's not flatter ourselves by thinking that we could never be deceived in this kind of way. Fearing God yet serving or honoring other gods, however unwittingly, may seem to be a contradiction and in some ways it is. So we all should be willing to continually and ruthlessly examine ourselves in our belief and practices to be certain that we are aligning with Yahweh's word. Now, the second dot, which I have entitled, the second, second example that I've entitled uh, concerning Israel's apostasy uh, is a divided kingdom. And a brief overview of some of Israel's history might be helpful here. 
After the death of Solomon, the Davidic kingdom was divided into two, the house of Israel, or the ten northern tribes under Jeroboam, and the house of Judah, or the two southern tribes under Rehoboam. Jeroboam and Rehoboam were enemies and continually at war with each other. This is confirmed from 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse 30, which says, And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. Because of these warning, warring conditions, many who otherwise would travel to Jerusalem three times a year in obedience to the command to appear before the Lord on Passover or unleavened bread, Pentecost and Tabernacles, and that command is found in Exodus twenty three fourteen. They were unlikely to be able to do so. Even if they were able to travel to the feast, Jeroboam was not going to risk their wanting to permanently stay at the house of David in Jerusalem. As an unrighteous alternative, Jeroboam set up two golden calves, one in Dan in the north and the other in in Bethel, the southern portion of the northern tribes, as the primary locations, the primary location of the northern kingdom's worship. The two golden calves that Jeroboam set up were nothing less than the reintroduction of the golden calf idols, or the star of your god, Saturn, that Israel worshipped at the foot of Mount Sinai during Moses' time. In 1 Kings 12, 28-31, we read, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their lord Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore the king, Jeroboam, asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which you brought up uh, from the land of Egypt, uh, Kiun, the star, uh, a star god of Saturn. And he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And he made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. In addition to a false system of worship with false appointed times, Jeroboam employed a false priesthood which led to the introduction of false Sabbaths, which we will see shortly. In 1 Kings 12, 32-33, we read, Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah in the 7th month, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the golden calves that he had made. And at Bethel he installed the priests of the high places which he had made. And he made offerings of the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month uh, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. Here we see how Jeroboam changed Yah's appointed time of Sukkot or tabernacles, from the 15th uh, day of the 7th month to the 15th day of the 8th month. This is right in line with Lucifer's stated purpose of changing the Moedim, or the appointed times, in Isaiah 14, 
verses 12 through 14 in Daniel 7:25. Was this Jeroboam's only unauthorized change of Yah's appointed times? It is very likely that he changed other appointed times or modim as well as considering uh, as well considering that he reigned over the ten northern tribes for a total of 22 years. Perhaps Amos has given us some insight about that as well. From the Septuagint, which is the Hebrew to Greek, Greek translation done about 200 BCE, uh, we read the following uh, from Amos 6.3. Ye are approaching the evil day who are drawing near and adopting false Sabbaths. And I add in parenthesis to calendar manipulation. The prophet Amos prophesied from about 760 to 755 BCE during the reign, reign of Jeroboam. When he wrote of Israel's false Sabbaths, we can reasonably deduce the likelihood that these false Sabbaths were introduced during Jeroboam's, uh, Jeroboam's reign as part of the golden calf idolatry, the star of your god, uh, Saturn. Most modern Bibles, unfortunately, translate Amos 6 3 b something like this who caused the seed of violence to come near, in place of where the Subduagent says adopting false Sabbaths. How are we to understand this difference in translation? Was it a deliberate attempt on the part of later transcript copyists to suppress the truth of Israel's false Sabbaths? For those who hold on to the typical uh, Amos 6.3b translation, the phrase, who caused the seed of violence to come near, could easily be another way of implying false Sabbaths, because seat is understood as throne, which is a metaphor for reign. Jeroboam, of course, was reigning during this time. Violence can take more than one form. Jeroboam did violence to the scriptures when he changed the date of Sukkot from the 15th of the 7th month to the 15th of the 8th month. If Jeroboam uh, altered Yah's weekly Sabbath, as is highly likely, he would have done violence to the scriptures again. In the next side, uh, slide, we will see another example of a form of violence other than physical violence. In Lamentations 2.6, we're told, that Yah had done violence by causing his appointed feasts and Sabbaths to be forgotten as a judgment for Israel's idolatry. Let's read this from Lamentations 2.6. And he has done violence to his tabernacle as if it were a garden. He has destroyed his place of assembly, or Moedim, the Lord has caused the appointed feasts and Sabbaths to be forgotten through an altered calendar in Zion. In his burning indignation, he has spurned the king and the priests. Altering the set time feasts and weekly Sabbaths didn't take the form of forgetting they existed or that they were God-ordained appointed times to meet with them. It took the form of corrupting the timing or calculation when those appointed times took place by altering Yah's calendar. Someone may ask, how could the Israelites have been deceived into substituting a false Sabbath for a true Sabbath? We can gain some insight about that from Ezekiel. And uh, let's read Ezekiel 22. 26. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbath. I am profaned among them. The Levitical priests are the ones who 
uh, are charged with keeping a separation between the holy and the profane, which means common. However, Jeroboam had appointed false priests who were obviously not concerned with separating the holy from the profane. The lack of separating the holy from the profane had to have been a calendar issue because it resulted in a replacing the true Sabbath with a false Sabbath. By mixing the holy, Yah's lunar solar calendar, and the profane, some sort of an unbiblical calendar alteration together, mixing them together. What would be one way of mixing the holy with the profane that could have taken place? If Jeroboam was one of the first, uh, was the first one who created the false Sabbath, as is highly likely, all he would have had to have done is to remove the new moon days functioning as an intermission to the weekly cycle at the end of each month. This mixture of the holy with the profane would have created endless rotating, uninterrupted weekly cycles, which in turn would have resulted in false Sabbaths. We may never know for sure, but it, it is cert, it, <clears throat> but it certainly would have served Jeroboam's purposes by creating more separation and more differences between Israel and his enemy Judah. So uh, for a better understanding of the new moon intermission days, please visit the website re uh, reference at the end of the study. Now let's read from 2 Kings 17, 18. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight by sending them into Assyrian captivity. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. Yah did not take kindly to Jeroboam changing Yah's set time appointments. Initially, the house of Judah under Rehoboam kept Yah's set time, set time modim or his appointments, but gradually over time, they too became contaminated with the idolatrous practices that the house of uh, Israel were in, uh, practicing under uh, Jeroboam. And uh, we find the confirmation of that in Second uh, Kings 17, chapter 17, verse 19. Also Judah did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes or set time ordinances of Israel, which they have made. The house of Judah went into captivity because of adopting the same idolatrous practices uh, as well as disregarding um, giving the land its Sabbath rest. They were eventually sent into captivity to Babylon as a result. A portion of the house of Judah did eventually repent, and some returned from Babylon. However, it was only a matter of time before the house of Judah eventually fell back again into their appointed time apostasies. Next. Next time, uh, well, let's just uh, let's just um, let's just move on here to the third example, the third dot that we're going to uh, connect from the apostolic scripture uh, from the apostolic scriptures in Acts. Uh, Chapter 6 and 7, Stephen was, with great grace and power, testifying of Yeshua's resurrection, Messiahship, and Gentile inclusion, which, con which uh, uh, was confronted by the scribes, elders, and false witnesses who wanted to stop his preaching. You can find that in uh, Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 14. As part of his defense before the council, <coughs> Stephen recounted some of Israel's history. We find that in Acts chapter 7, verses 1 through 60. 
including the account of Israel's idolatry in the wilderness, which is verses 37 through 43, with the worship of the golden calves. Stephen wasn't recounting this part of Israel's history because he thought that they might have forgotten their history, but because he was drawing similar parallels which uh, should have served as a warning about potential judgments that would eventually befall post-apostolic Israel if they persisted in their rebellion. So let's read a pertinent portion of what Stephen had to say. In Acts chapter 7, verses 37 to 43, we read, This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him, Yeshua, you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. We can see here how Stephen is recounting ancient Israel's hasty rejection of Moses, which he knows many will rightly compare uh, with Israel's current rejection of Yeshua. And uh, in verse 41, it says, chapter 7, Acts 7, verse 41, and they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during these 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your God, Rephim, the star of your God, i.e. Saturn, uh, emphasis mine, images which you have made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Uh, this should all be sounding familiar by now. Next, we will see quotes that confirm the Greek word refon is kiyun in Hebrew, both of which point to the worship of the star god Saturn. From the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, we read refon, a name for kiyun, the planet, the planet Saturn. And from the King James Bible Online.org, we read in Amos 5:26 in Hebrew, Kion is rendered by the LXX, which is Septuagint, Rephan, and his name is adopted by Luke in his narrative of the Acts. These names represent the star god of, of Saturn or Molech. And from um, hopeofisrael.org we read this following quote, Rephon is merely the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Kion. Because of their apostasy in worshiping Saturn, Yahweh stated that he would eventually allow them to be carried away beyond Babylon. Babylon originated with Nimrod and is the very foundation of all idolatrous religions coming down through time ever since. The result of rebelliously trying to worship the Creator by a counterfeit system of worship calculated by a counterfeit method of calculation is to be given over to that counterfeit system and have the knowledge of the true Sabbath completely lost. From Vincent's new 
Testament word studies we read, the texts vary between Remphon, Rephon, and Romphon. It is supposed to be the Coptic, Coptic name for Saturn to which the Arabs, Egyptians, and Phoenicians paid divine honors. Jameson Fawcett Brown Bible commentary, commentary have this to say. The Septuagint translates Kiun or image into Rephan as Stephen quotes it uh, and that's in Acts uh, 7 verses 42 and 43. The same God often had different names. Rephan was the Egyptian name for Saturn. From Wikipedia, we read, Rephan is a rendering from the ancient Greek. It is part of a reference to Amos 5.26, which reads in Hebrew as Kiyun, Kiwan, or Kijun. The Septuagint's reading of Amos is Rephan. Kiwan is another pronunciation of the old Persian word for Kayan, meaning Saturn. Now we're going to consider some significant parallels between Moses and Yeshua. The first parallel is that both prophets are alike by design. Acts 7.37 says, This is that Moses who said to the children in Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, which is Yeshua, from your brethren, him you shall hear. The second parallel is that both prophets would be delayed in their returning. Exodus 32 verse 40 saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. In Second Peter, in chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. The third parallel, both prophets rejected. Exodus thirty-two thirty-eight says, This is he, Moses, who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey but rejected. In Luke 17, 25, but he, Yeshua, must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. <clears throat> the fourth parallel. Israel's rejection of both prophets led to idolatry. In Exodus 32, 39 through 42, uh, we read, We do not know what has become of him. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, and they made a calf in those days offered sacrifices to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, the star, God of Saturn. Uh, uh, in, uh, end of parenthesis. Luke 23:18. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, and release to us Barnabas. We will shortly see how Yeshua's rejection, although delayed, led to the eventual return of the star of your God, Saturn. Someone may say, okay, I see the connection between Saturn and the Hebrew Kion and the Greek Rephon in Israel's history, but what does that have to do with us today? Answer. It has a lot of things to do with us, especially if we are Saturday Sabbath-keeping believers because of a well-known and well-documented Saturn Saturday Sabbath connection. And we see a depiction here of the star of your god, Kiyun, Saturn, which is shown as Saturday. 
Now we're going to read some uh, quotes. The uh, celebrated Saturday gets its name from the planet, planet Saturn, end quote. Now, I'm not going to read all of the references here, but I will read you the quotes and the references can be looked up at your leisure. Next quote, the weekday Saturn, Saturday, parenthesis, Latin Saturni dies, and uh, uh, was named for Saturn, end quote. Named after the Roman and Egyptian god and planet Saturn, Saturday is the only day of the week that re retained its Roman origin in English. You can find that quote from timeanddate.com. Another quote, Saturday is also named after the Roman god Saturn, i.e. Saturn's day, end quote. And from Hutton Webster in his book, Rest Days, page 244, we read, the Jewish Sabbath seems to have always corresponded to Saturn's day, or uh, Saturday, uh, uh, my emphasis here, in parenthesis. From Elaine Bornhort, Holt, and Laura Lee, uh, Laura Lee uh, Born Holt Jones, we read the following quote. The word Saturday means Saturn's day, or the day belonging to the god Saturn. Most, if not all, of the ancient religions had Saturn in their pantheons of, pantheon of gods. Known as Saturnus to the Romans, he was Kronos, to the Greeks, the Phoenicians, Car uh, Car Carthaginians, and the Canaanites referred to Saturn as Baal. The person from whom these various legends extend is none other than Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Before actually means against, against the Lord. And that's from uh, Four Angels uh, Publications .com. So I hope everybody caught that. And I'm going to reread that quote. The word Saturday means Saturn's day, or the day belonging to the god Saturn. Does that remind you of Lucifer's stated purpose in Isaiah 14 verses 12 through 14 that we saw earlier? In the next slide, an article published by the Katz Center entitled Saturn and the Jews, we notice the Hebrew name for Saturn is Shabbatai, which clearly links the two. And here's the quote. Underlying the well-known link between Saturday, a parenthesis Shabbat in Hebrew, and Saturn or Shabbat, Tai in Hebrew, uh, is the reference to Saturn as the planet in charge of the Jews. The Jewish society of the Talmudic, Tal Talmudic period recognized the same association is shown by the fact that the Babylonian Talmud refers to Saturn as Shabbatai, the star of Shabbat or Saturday. Israel's rejection of Yeshua led to the judgment of Jerusalem in 70 AD, followed by another dispersion. This in turn paved the way for another apostasy, albeit a delayed one. Between the second and the fourth century, there began a slow, gradual transition away from the biblical lunar calendar that Israel was observing to a solar-only planetary calendar in which the moon no longer acted as a one- or two-day intermission of the weekly Sabbath. 
By 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea officially adopted the Roman planetary calendar with its fixed Saturday cycle. This is nothing less than the reintroduction of another calendar that mixes the holy and the profane, the removal of the monthly uh, new moon intermission days as a way of reintroducing the same old unbiblical Sabbath cycle. There's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9 tells us. Note, even the Sabbath years uh, Sabbath of years, or seven times seven years for a, for a total of 49 years, has an intermission year at the end of its cycle. It's called the Jubilee year. So intermission to uh, Sabbath counts should not uh, take, uh, take us by surprise. In an article entitled Constantine I and Hillel II, Two Men Who Deceived the Whole World, we read, one of the greatest frauds in history of the whole world was penetrated almost, perpetrated almost 1,700 years ago by the actions of two men. The Roman Emperor Constantine committed a portentous act he, he uh, unified his empire by promoting Sunday as the day of Yeshua's resurrection and outlawed the use of the biblical calendar for calculating Passover. This set in motion a series of reactions. Jewish leader Hillel II responded to the persecution following this legislation by a modification of the biblical calendar where that took place in approximately 359 AD. This supplanted the true Sabbath with the pagan Saturday. It was a chain of actions and reactions of epic proportions. The ramifications continue to this day. Every, uh, to this day with every Christian and Jew that worships by the Gregorian calendar. And that quote was from worldslastchance.com. Did Saturday become Israel's spiritual golden calf in the fourth century? There is an ever-growing number of people who are answering that question in the affirmative. Many uh, today unwittingly honor Saturday or Saturn's Day as the Seventh-day Sabbath by theology, practice, and or testimony, when in fact it is a counterfeit of the true biblical Sabbath. The scriptures are clear. The sun and the moon, and this is a reference from Genesis 1, 14 through 16, the sun and the moon working together are what determine the true biblical Sabbath, not endless cycling of weeks without intermission month after month, year after year, as a stronghold of tradition the biblical principle is that two or three witnesses uh, are needed to establish a matter. Uh, and certainly the biblical Sabbath is a matter that needs to be established by two or three witnesses. The sun only, which is only one witness, falls short of establishing the biblical Sabbath. There it is. The dots are connected. Three set time apostasies are all connected to the star god of Saturn. Worshipping of the golden calves at Mount Sinai. Worshipping of the golden calves at Dan and Bethel. And the adoption of Rome's unbiblical calendar resulted in honoring it's counterfeit Saturday Sabbath uh, 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 or Saturn Day. Note, I believe that a distinction can be made between honor and worship. We can honor somebody without worshiping them. We can honor something without worshiping it. 
Believers today whose theology and practice hold that Saturday is a Sabbath do not, in my opinion, worship the God of Saturn. But by calling Saturday the Sabbath, they give honor to it rather than honoring Yahweh's true Sabbath. Honoring is a counterfeit honoring a counterfeit Sabbath is not something that believers should be doing. At the same time, this is not an issue that we should break fellowship or create division over. Unity of the spirit always trumps unity of doctrine. From the hopeofisrael.org we read, the particulars of Israel's apostasies are recorded in scripture as recorded in scripture, reveal that the worship of Saturn featured predominantly in the religious rebellions. While modern Saturday Sabbatarians do not worship by burning their children, the fact remains that the day on which one worships honors the God of that, <coughs> honors the God of that day. Saturn is the God of Saturday. Yahweh, the Creator God, is the God of the seventh day Sabbath calculated by his lunar solar calendar. Worship on any other day calculated by any other calendar gives honor to a God rather than to the Creator. Is there another parallel between ancient and post-apostolic Israel? While not provable from scripture, there appears to be an interesting parallel between the ancient and post-apostolic Israel. Why was ancient Israel originally consigned to spending 40 years of wandering in the wilderness? And we'll see here from Numbers 14.34, it says, According to the number of days which you have spied out the land, 40 days, <clears throat> for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. The 40 years in the wilderness came about as a year for a day judgment for the 40 days Israel spent spying out the promised land, but then rejecting it by coming back with a bad report. The spiritual promised land. Could Yeshua be the personification of the spiritual promised land? Israel had 40 years to examine the fruit of this promised land, starting with the examination of the fruit of Yeshua's life for three and a half years, and then his life and fruit through his disciples whom he indwelt until the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That's a total of 40 years. But the leadership of the first, of first century Israel rejected this promised spiritual land, or Yeshua, and continues to do so to this day. As a result of Judah's rejection of Yeshua as their Messiah and spiritual promised land, it appears that they have been experiencing a jubilee for a year judgment, 40 jubilees times 50 years each for each jubilee equals 2,000 years. Like ancient Israel, Post-apostolic Israel, primarily the house of Judah, continues to, quote, carry along, end quote, in another wilderness judgment, spiritually speaking, the idols of Hune, the star god Saturn, in the form of honoring Saturday or Saturn's day in place of the true biblical seventh-day uh, Sabbath. Conclusion, 
as wild olive branches having been grafted into the cultivated olive tree, every believer has a lot for which we can be thankful. As spiritual Israel, there remains much which we can still learn from natural Israel, to whom belong the adoptions, the glory, the covenants, the giving of law, the service of God, and the promises. That's from Romans chapter 9, verse 4. However, we uh, must also be discerning and willing to examine every tradition, whether from the church or from Judaism, and hold only to that which is consistent with God's word. Anything that is found to be contrary to scripture must be rejected. Such is the case with the unbiblical Saturday Sabbath. A thorough consideration of the biblical lunar solar Sabbath is beyond the scope of this study. However, <coughs> it, is important, it is an important topic worthy of careful and prayerful consideration. For those who have a genuine desire to better understand why a growing number of believers are embracing the Lunar Solar Sabbath, I would refer the reader to www.lunarsabbathday.com. In the meantime, consider this, Psalm 19.2 says, day unto day utter speech, night unto night reveals knowledge. And we see here a picture of Yah's tamper-proof Sabbaths that are found in the heavenlies in accordance with the moon's phases. Psalm 104.19 tells us, he appointed the moon for seasons, which means Moedim, appointed times. It does not mean summer, winter, spring, and fall. It means appointed times. No, appointed the moon for his appointed times. Israel's <coughs> adoption of the profane planetary calendar with its missing new moon intermission days has resulted in hiding the two Sabbaths, which are the 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th on the lunar solar calendar. Hiding uh, those Sabbaths, two Sabbaths from Israel and the body of Messiah, the church. But it is never hidden from those who will but look up into the heavens to behold Elohim's tamper-proof Sabbath, ignoring the moon, contrary to the scriptures, has and will always result in unbiblical Sabbaths. And I, that will conclude our study for today, and I trust that this has held a blessing for you in Yeshua's name. Amen.